I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series, Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, HDIAC. Today's presentation is entitled, A Comprehensive Introduction to Medical Simulation. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. A few administrative notes before we begin. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a couple of days. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. Funding that DTIC provides enables HDIAC to conduct these webinars. It's a pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar. First is Dr. Roger Smith, who has spent 25 years creating leading edge simulators for the DOD and intelligence agencies. Uh, Roger is currently the Chief Technology Officer for the Advent Health Nicholson Center, where he is responsible for establishing technology strategy and leading research experiments. Uh, Dr. Smith has served as the CTO for the U.S. Army PEO SPI, VP and CTO for Training Systems at Titan Corp, and VP of Technology at PTG Inc. Also presenting today is uh, Danielle Julian. He's a senior research scientist at uh, Advent Health Nicholson Center as well. Her current research focuses on robotic surgery simulation and effective surgeon training. Danielle's projects include intelligent tutoring systems, rapid prototyping of surgical education devices, and the evaluation of robotic simulation systems. Julian is a certified instructor for surgical robotic courses delivered to surgeons and OR staff members. He has a background involving human factors, and learning and training to enhance higher order cognitive skills of military personnel. Currently, uh, a PhD student in modeling simulation at the University of Central Florida. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Smith. Uh, good afternoon, Roger. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Steve. I appreciate you all inviting us to give this presentation. Uh, this is a tutorial which we previously did at the Inter-Service Industry Training, Education, and Simulation Conference, better known as ITSIC and uh, something that I'm glad that it's, it's useful for people beyond that organization. So I think we'll jump right into some of the, the material that we can do. So this, this tutorial is meant to be like an overview, kind of East Coast to West Coast, covering everything that we know about um, medical modeling and simulation. Um, it's not deep in, it, in many of the areas, but it is very broad. And so hopefully once we're done, you'll have an understanding of almost all of the tools and the techniques that are out there. And we're going to uh, focus on the contribution that simulation makes to patient safety especially. Um, I've included some material that's historical in nature um, for two reasons. One is I really enjoy historical background. And two, when you look back 100 years at what people were doing in medical simulation, you can see that they had some of the same ideas that we have today. They just didn't have the technology tools to bring them to fruition the way we do now. And then you'll see a pattern in medical simulation if you need to categorize it. I'll give you a hint now. It kind of looks like a four-leaf clover um, that will give you a, a good set of um, categories or a taxonomy for understanding the whole field. And then hopefully you'll be able to better evaluate medical simulation devices when we're, we're done. All right, so I decided to put a couple of ideas right up front, um, things that are re really new in medical simulation that we're excited to see coming into the field. And I did this at the beginning instead of at the end because I thought you'd have uh, your attention focus a little better now than an hour from now. So I wanted to make sure that you saw these while your mind was still fresh. So we're at a um, education center that's part of a very large hospital system. And we usually train clinicians and especially surgeons uh, 
who are practicing in their profession. And here are two tools that we found that uh, are really interesting for doing that kind of teaching. So one of them is animated tissue that's embedded inside of a plastic and silicone shell. So simulation devices or simulation materials um, typically have kept those two separate. So you might do a training exercise on a living pig or goat or something like that, or you might do um, simulation training on synthetic organs like um, hearts and lungs and pieces made out of silicone materials usually. And these devices start to combine those two. And so you walk up to a plastic and silicone, it looks like a cadaver, um, and you have to cut through the outer layers of skin and navigate through the bones. And once you get inside, you don't find a synthetic heart to work on in this case. What you find is an excised porcine heart that has been hooked up to a pump and it contains a blood-like substance and it's beating. And so you're operating on real tissue in this simulation environment and you're getting real response when you cut into areas of the tissue that should be um, extruding blood. So that's really exciting and it's relatively affordable because you're combining materials that were being used already um, in your simulation training events. And then the second one is a similar idea but takes it a little further. We've seen two companies that take a full cadaver which we use in medical training all the time. And they hook it up to a blood pump and circulate a liquid through it that's meant to um, act like blood but not clot and get the pump running. And when you do that, all of the tissue that was previously cadaveric, meaning it was yellow and it was flat and it really looked partially decayed and dead, it all comes back to life. Once this red fluid starts flowing through the body, the tissue takes on uh, the color of the red fluid and looks alive. And the organs, especially in this case, the heart will take on, it, it beats kind of, not exactly like a real beating heart, but it still contracts and expands. And when the surgeons operate on these uh, perfused cadavers, they report that they can't tell the difference from either the look or the feel between this cadaveric tissue and real patients. And so they're very excited about the possibility of doing um, surgical training on cadaveric tissue, which previously wasn't very exciting because everybody could see that the tissue was dead and it didn't extrude blood when you cut into it um, and it didn't quiver a little bit as the blood flowed through it. Uh, so they're very excited about that. Uh, this approach is a little bit more expensive, um, so you can really only insert it into a training event that has a budget that can afford um, a cadaver plus a little bit more uh, investment. But it's still a really interesting thing that's starting to happen right now. Okay, so there's what's new right up front, a couple of ideas to work with. Something that Danielle and I both noticed coming from the defense simulation industry, in that industry, there are really very few textbooks explaining how defense simulation is done, how military simulation, interactive uh, simulation is done. There are books are certainly on virtual reality and those kinds of topics, but that really capture how it's done for the military, there's very few books. And when we moved into healthcare and started working for a hospital, we found exactly the opposite was true. There are literally a couple of dozen books exploring almost every, every flavor and every brand of simulation that's practiced in healthcare. Uh, there are entire books that just talk about how to create medical moulage. There are entire books for training standardized patients or for creating team-based live events. Uh, there are entire books on how to lay out a physical simulation facility and where the uh, equipment should go and what kind of software and hardware you, you might need. We were really surprised to find that there were literally a dozen of these 
uh, or a couple dozen of these uh, in the healthcare space where there are almost none in the defense space. So the publishers have worked with the healthcare community much more closely. Um, and so a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this uh, tutorial, this presentation, you can go find more details about most of them in some of these textbooks. All right, I want to start with some history. Um, I went into some of these books that I just showed you and I looked for the oldest example of simulation and modeling in healthcare that I could find. And this is the oldest example of a model of uh, tissue that I could find. Uh, it's about 2,000 years BC and it's a clay model of a sheep's liver. Uh, it takes the form of the liver of a sheep and you can see they've divided the liver into, into grids and put a, a hole in each one of the grids. And that's a teaching technique so that the instructor can put a peg in those holes and explain what it means if you find a lesion or a defect in different parts of the liver. And they would be teaching students whether this liver um, indicates that this sheep is either number one good for consumption or whether it might have a disease that you shouldn't serve it to your family and your community. So they were learning kind of what a doctor would need to know. But the second thing they were teaching them was if there's lesions in certain areas of the liver, then this sheep is not acceptable as a sacrifice to their gods. And so it's a religious teaching tool as well. And so it's not a simulation in that it's dynamic, but it's a model in that it's a teaching tool to show people um, how, how to choose a, a sheep for either medical uses or health uses or for religious uses. And it has the advantage that most simulations and models have. If you can't find a sheep that has the lesion or the defect in every one of these regions to show your students, this is the next best, best thing. So you can stick a peg in there and say, if you find a lesion here, and then move all through the liver to explain um, what either your uh, knowledge of healthcare or your knowledge of the religion uh, dictates in that case. I thought that was the most fascinating case. So we jump forward quite a bit here. Um, anatomy textbooks were at a time when in order to convey what the anatomy looked like, bones and muscles, uh, the only way to convey that and move it through society from city to city was to print it on the relatively new printing presses and this distributed in pictorial form. So folios or later bound books that had all of this information in it made a huge difference in the ability to distribute medical knowledge. So it would be possible for one city to understand some features of anatomy but not be able to communicate that to the next city or the next state over because there just wasn't a medium for that information to travel conveniently. And so when the printing press made creating books like this more feasible, um, that information started to flow more like water and it started, you started to have a society where everyone had access to the, the same level of information. If you look in some of the classic paintings, you'll find um, scenes taken from the operating room or from healthcare situations. Uh, the, the picture on the left is actually a Rembrandt painting uh, done in 1632. And uh, he sat in or, and, and watched an anatomy lesson where the instructor was dissecting a cadaver and explaining to his colleagues uh, what all the different features were that are inside of that cadaver. And so those became the subjects of, of what we consider today to be very famous and very valuable paintings. And then uh, Mauchi is a much less uh, well-known artist, but he did roughly the same thing for a lesson where the instructor was vivi vivisecting a dog. And you can almost see the pain on the dog's face um, as they're doing this, this lesson. Uh, so you, you know that this is how many medical professionals learned anatomy was through these uh, rather, I don't know, a little bit horrific um, uh, classes. So the first device that you might attach the label simulator uh, to that I could find 
uh, came out around 1740, and it was called the Breathing Venus. And the uh, inventor, Benjamin Hoadley, he didn't build something that looked like your lungs. He built something that was a great teaching tool so he could explain to students how the lungs worked. And so he built the wooden box up at the top with valves on it, and the bags that are inside that wooden box represent the lungs. And when they're full of air, that's when you inhale, as in the one on the left. And when they're um, collapsed, that's when you exhale, as the one on the right. And he didn't have a mechanism for um, reproducing the diaphragm that causes that inhale and exhale. So he had these bags full of air down below. And when you squeeze it, it creates a positive pressure that squeezes the air out of the, quote, lung above. And so by using this device, he could explain how the lungs worked, though he didn't have a device that looked anything like the real lungs. But it helped convey how the function um, worked in the human body. And then roughly around the same time in Italy, um, a, a, a scientist and physician decided to recreate the circulatory system inside the body. And since the circulatory system is so integrated with the muscles and the flesh, it's really difficult to trace it. And so he literally extracted the vessels from multiple cadavers and tried to get them in whole pieces and then reassembled them on the skeleton from another person in the right location so that you could follow the uh, circulation of the blood in the human body. And he did dye them red and blue to show whether the blood is traveling to or from the heart so you would know which direction this blood was coming and going from. Uh, that was an excruciating amount of work. It's hard to imagine how long he must have spent uh, assembling this model. But even given that it, let's say it took a, even a year to assemble this, um, the device has um, survived 250 years, so it was probably worth the investment. And we don't know how long from 1763 forward that it was actually used as a teaching tool before it became a museum piece, which it is now. And then here's a synthetic anatomical model, not that different from uh, the one you saw earlier. Um, it's an anatomical Venus from just before 1800. And it typically, it shows something very typical of models of that time. The subject is usually a woman. And men and women both have the same heart and lungs and ribs. And most of our organs are, are the same, though different sizes. But women have something that men don't have that was especially important back then and that the level of medical education was able to do something about. And that was giving birth. So many of the models back then are women because the focus of them is usually teaching safe childbirth and helping people to understand how the baby develops in the womb and then later when it's bigger, how to actually deliver it. Because delivering a baby was something that was essential for life, both for the mother and the baby, but it was also something that was simple enough that the medical knowledge at that time could do something about. So being competent at it um, could be, was something that could be trained. So you see a lot of models back at that time that are women. And that's, that's why even to this day you see a lot of female um, mannequins and models because uh, a big focus is childbirthing. OK, I came, came back to textbooks. I almost left this one out. I mean, this is a. The first one is a textbook from 1876. And it's that typical layers through the skin and the muscles and the tendons and the bones and the blood vessels that you see in books that you can get down at the local Barnes and Noble now. That idea of layering and putting all the pictures together uh, is still something that's very popular in medical texts now. Um, but it was something that we know was happening at least 150 years ago or 100 and almost 150 years ago now. And that was a tool for teaching very much like the earlier models. It's just that they're based on paper instead of uh, paraffin wax and, and bones. And then in 1911, 
uh, a woman who was a nurse and a teacher at a hospital created something that we now call the Josephine Chase dolls. Uh, Josephine Chase was at home and realized that she needed help with teaching nurses how to handle patients in very simple external ways, you know, how to lift them, how to transfer them from a rolling table to their patient bed, um, how to bathe them, how to change their clothes, how to change the sheets from under them. There are literally dozens of tasks where you needed to manipulate um, a patient. And of course, what were they doing before this? They were all taking turns being the patient by laying down on the bed and being rolled and, and uh, clothes changed. And so she made these dolls at home and started bringing them into her hospital in Hartford and using them as a teaching tool at this hospital. And that's kind of the beginning of some of the inert mannequins that you see today from Laerdal or CAE Health, places like that where you buy a mannequin and its job mostly is to be bendable at the joints, weigh approximately what a patient would weigh, and be something that you can put clothes on and roll over and, and maybe palpate a little bit. So she started that in 1911. And then she was followed by people who said, you know, this, this mannequin as a tool for manipulation is really useful. And so um, re resuscitation ventilator dolls, uh, which just had bags in them that could accept air, uh, allowed anesthesiologists to practice the delivery of medications. And of course, you can't tell the difference between the effectiveness of the medication but at least it can help you get the volume right. So if you see the lungs inflating, you can decide how much volume you need to push into somebody um, with the crude ventilation equipment of the 1900s. And then I slipped onto the slide also a re relatively famous uh, picture of Asmund Laerdal. He's the inventor or the, the uh, creator of the Laerdal mannequin company uh, today. And he's the one that invented what we call re recessa ani now. And it was initially meant to help resuscitate people who had drowned. Um, and that's how that all got started back around the beginning, early 1900s. The first mechanical simulation where you would start to draw a, a, a lineage from what we have today to what they were creating back then was something called Sim 1. And it was created in 1967 with funding from the Department of Education. It wasn't a defense project, it was an education project. And a couple of doctors in anesthesiology uh, wanted a mannequin that they could practice on that was more advanced than the one that you saw from 1907. And so they built a mannequin and attached it to pumps and mechanical machinery and to, quote, computers. These were analog computers of the 1960s. And they created a mannequin that could not, you could not only push air into, but it could breathe. It had a beating heart. It exhibited a pulse in its arm. It had a blood pressure. And it had blinking eyes. All features that we find now in the mannequins that are built in the you know, 2020s. It also had a physiologic response to drugs. So that was the, the job of the newly invented computers was to recognize how much um, um, air was being forced into the mannequin and programming what kind of air that was, you know, what kind of gas it was. And then when that, that gas or air um, was received by the body, programming the mannequin to respond to that um, in an appropriate way. So if you over, um, over gassed it or if you give it too much anesthesia, its heartbeat would slow down, its rate would slow down, um, he would stop blinking, he would essentially begin to die. And so you could understand when you're giving too much and also when you're giving too little because the mannequin wouldn't go to sleep. And so a mannequin with those kinds of capabilities uh, first appeared in 1967, which was much, much earlier than I would have guessed. If, if I had been asked about when something like this emerged, I would have guessed around the 1980s because I would have been counting on a more advanced computer existing to control it. Uh, but they were quite clever getting the analog computers to do it back in the 60s. And then the first simulator that is called virtual reality uh, appeared around 1995. 
and the, uh, the motivation for it was the relatively new practice of laparoscopic surgery. So laparoscopic surgery, uh, you insert a small camera into the abdomen in order to do a gallbladder surgery or something like that. And then the small instruments go into other holes and the scene from the camera comes up on a computer monitor. And that made a really natural interface where you could slip a simulator in between the hand controls and what was coming to your eyes. It was really the first time when you would be manipulating hand controls and looking at a scene on a computer screen and you would say, well, that's how I do surgery anyway. I don't do surgery by directly observing the flesh. I do it by seeing this, this TV image on the computer screen. And so it made creating a 3D computer image and putting it onto the screen uh, much more amenable and much more natural or realistic to the real surgery. Now, I know in the picture they show uh, tissue models in there. Um, those tissue models are a little more advanced than what was really in the simulator in 1995. The models of the balls and the tubes that you see on the right, those were the original exercises that were programmed into the simulator in 1995. And the MIST-VR simulator actually continued to be modified and evolved for about 20 years after that. And I, I don't think that by that brand name it still exists, but certainly the grandchild of that simulator still exists and is available from the simulator companies. Okay, so that's the history. Uh, so that brings you from uh, BC all the way up to roughly the future. And we, we looked at maybe 10 different simulators back then. So you get a flavor for it, though not, it's not exhaustive. Now I want to talk about some of the taxonomies of simulation. Um, understanding a taxonomy is really helpful because it helps you organize the world into a few categories so you don't have to treat every instance as unique and separate and different. You get to treat dozens or maybe hundreds of instances as belonging to the same family and it, it helps a great deal uh, with management and decision making especially. So the military has been um, benefited greatly from the creation of a taxonomy of military simulation. I don't like to admit it, but I'm old enough that I was practicing military simulation before this taxonomy was created. And there was confusion among all of the projects that were sponsored by the military to create simulation and training events because those who were creating what's called virtual simulation or immersive flight simulator-like uh, devices had a very different opinion of what was absolutely necessary from those who were creating constructive simulations, which are essentially war games that live in a computer and have their roots back to board war games. And it, it wasn't clear how you um, settled arguments between these communities and also the live community. So back around 1995, um, the military started to formalize the fact that we have three different kinds of simulators or three different kinds of simulation tools. They are live, where a human is instrumented and runs around and does their, their um, actions in the real world, or trucks or tanks or vehicles, even airplanes do it in the real world. Then there are virtual simulators where the simulation immerses you into a world that looks like the real thing, but there's nobody out there but you. And then there's constructive simulations where there's lots of people that are essentially playing a very, very big game of chess, where there might be hundreds of human players on the outside edge, uh, but the objects that they're manipulating don't exist on, in the real space. And those three were live virtual constructive. That was the taxonomy for a number of years until computer games started to be accepted as a fourth form of simulation. And when they first came in, they caused a um, confusion because some wanted to call them virtual, but the virtual world argued they didn't belong there because they weren't immersive. And they, could, they didn't really fit as constructive because they were so detailed and so um, single object oriented. So you're moving a single object, single helicopter in this scene. So the LVCG um, taxonomy now kind of dominates the way the military thinks about and categorizes all of its simulations. Well, there have been discussions about whether that 
taxonomy will work for healthcare. And our opinion is that it will not. That when you start to understand the uh, problems that healthcare is addressing and the kinds of things that they try to represent, that LVCG just doesn't work. It's like putting a square peg in a, raw, in a round hole. And so without a lot of manipulation, you're, it's just not going to fit. Well, we weren't the only ones to think that. There have been people trying to create a taxonomy for healthcare simulation for almost 20 years that I'm aware of. And here's a taxonomy presented by Richard Satava back in 2001. Um, at that time, he proposed that there were four levels of uh, simulation that formed a taxonomy. Um, the first one is very simple where you're just practicing the precision placement of the treatment that you're trying to give, in this case, inserting a needle. And there's no response involved. Um, all of the feedback that you get is from an instructor who's telling you what you've done right or what you've done wrong. And then the second level is where you have a mannequin or something like it that has essentially one function inside of it. And you can do an ultrasound of this mannequin because inside of their gel body there's a tumor or a baby or something that you can see on ultrasound. And so that's the next step up. So this is a single use physical device. And then the third one is, in his examples, it becomes, it supports more complex manipulation. And computer generated scenes for surgery are a good example of that where with um, physical hand controls for laparoscopic or robotic tools and virtual reality for the inner scene, you can almost do all of the actions that you would do in a real surgery. And then the last one was an integrated procedure. And that's different because under complex manipulation, he's imagining a world where you might be picking up rings and putting balls in a bowl. You're doing all these manipulations in an environment that's much more simplified than real surgery. And then in the fourth one, you actually end up creating a simulation environment that has a real procedure where you can actually uh, do a hysterectomy or actually do remove a gallbladder, that all the pieces are there and they function in some way. And so that was his vision of what a taxonomy should look like back in 2001. And it's pretty good. It fits surgery really pretty well but it doesn't um, encompass everything else. And so we'll see some more taxonomies that are a little broader than this. Another taxonomy imagines in dividing um, medical simulation according to the type of materials you're using. So if you're using virtual reality down at the bottom, then those simulators are primarily computer generated. Or if you're using a mannequin or a part task trainer, um, or a human patient simulator, then you're using mechanical tools. And then on the top is the conditions where you're using um, cadaveric tissue, animal tissue, a human patient as a simulator, standardized patients, or you're creating a team environment where the important events are happening between the human, the human teams. So that creates three categories. Or if you label each one of them, about a dozen categories. And that's pretty useful, especially the virtual, mechanical, and biological. Um, but I think there's, there's one more that's a little better. And so in um, 2013, um, a, a woman published this paper in a medical journal that said, you know, I see uh, healthcare simulation really falling into four categories. There's the virtual reality simulation where you're creating uh, something in 3D, and that's very typical of surgery. Then there are part task trainers where we've essentially, quote, amputated uh, one part of the human body, at least in silicone form, and we're only working with uh, a throat or an arm or a leg or a heart or just one piece of the anatomy. There are human patient simulators, which are the mannequins that are very complex and very detailed inside now. And for at least if you only have to operate on the outside of them, um, they're almost living. If you cut into them, you'll find out that they're a robot like Westworld on the outside. Uh, they breathe and have heart rhythms and everything. And then there's the fourth is the standardized patients, where the humans are playing the role of a simulator. And 
she added to that and said, in reality, in her experience in, in healthcare and hospital training, um, most events are hybrids. In most events, you combine at least two of these and occasionally three or four of them. And so the event that's happening uh, is not just one of these alone. And I think that taxonomy really does a lot more for organizing this field than the other that came before it. And I think this has the potential to be uh, the taxonomy that's the LBCG uh, equivalent for healthcare. All right. So in healthcare simulation, there are a lot of people that come out of the learning and experiential learning and the psychology of learning. And so you find a lot of information in it about what are the best tools and best techniques to create learning. Um, regardless of whether it's a simulator, they see the training as more important than the simulator itself. And so uh, creating learning is more important than everything else. Um, and uh, I see I better step along a little faster. Um, the most typical progression is what you would expect Didactic learning leads to partial task trainer. That's where you have one part of the human anatomy. Leads to a full up uh, human patient simulator and then leads to interaction between multiple people. So that's the most uh, common progression through education. And that matches up with some of the theories that come out. Um, we don't have time to go through the details on this slide, but the important part of this is that um, the education happens through experience and then gives you time to reflect on what you learned, like after action reviews in the military, and then conceptualize that into your practice and then roll back and experiment with it again. And so there's this constant cycle of doing and thinking and then changing how you behave and then doing it over again. And of course, they use Bloom's taxonomy of learning to demonstrate that everybody's at a different place on this continuum. Some people are just learning facts while other people are learning to understand the concept behind those facts. And then as you progress up, you're, you're able to decompose those concepts and propose new ideas and create um, new training materials, new training curriculum, because you really understand the context and the importance and the way those facts fit together. Similar to that, there's a assessment tool called Mittler's Pyramid for assessing clinical competence. And they're essentially looking at people and trying to decide if they just know the facts, if they can interpret those facts and apply them, if they can demonstrate them as in teaching them, and if they're actually using those facts in their practice. And something that we encounter in all of our uh, studies of education in, in surgery, surgery especially, is we're challenged by the fact that we can measure how well people learn something in a classroom environment, but then the whole community is challenged to figure out, is that surgeon or that clinician going back to their practice and doing it day to day in practice? And that's one of the modern challenges that everybody's wrestling with on how do we capture that information to see if our education is really changing their behavior in the real world. All right, this is where we transition over to Danielle, and she's going to start off with standardized patients. Thank you, Roger, and hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so Roger gave us uh, the history behind simulation, and I'm going to share simulation for internal all the way to external anatomy and procedures. So we'll start with standardized patients. So these are used extensively in nursing education specifically to allow students to practice and improve clinical skills and conversational skills before they actually go to the patient. Um, they can be used to help students learn professional conduct in potentially embarrassing situations like a pelvic or breast exam. Um, the standardized patients can provide a level of emotion that a lot of the other simulation categories can't. So they're going to cry like the real concerned family member would be. They'll scream as if they were hurt. Um, and then they can also provide some real-time feedback. One step further is a hybrid hybrid simulation, um, and this focuses on um, providing 
better clinical practice by using standardized patients with an emulators or other pieces of equipment, kind of like Roger explained before. So it's kind of pairing those two together. Um, and a good example of that is the military application for the cut suit. Uh, this is an immer uh, immersive learning science where, or service, sorry, where a medical trained acting professional wears a moulage suit over their chest, torso, and sometimes their limbs. Um, and it's really unique because when you cut the suit, they have the ability to respond um, to realistic wounds, but on a live patient who's actually acting in an emotional uh, manner. And then I know Roger also mentioned a part test trainer. Um, so this is a model that represents just a specific anatomical part. It usually focuses on one or two tasks and they're tra they're made to be pretty cheap so that way you can train a fairly simple task without all the other costs associate associated with them um, they focus on things like tourniquet placement or needle placement for extracting blood and they're really used in simulation to get down the muscle memory some of the devices are even uh, more advanced and they provide medical or electronical feedback to the learner for their procedural skills but typically they're as basic as they come, just so that a learner can practice in a repetitive manner. So Roger kind of showed when um, mannequins started coming into play, um, and now we have high fidelity simulators that we use, and it provides a somewhat hybrid between that standardized patient and the part test trainer. The patient's not real, but it does provide realistic feedback and it reacts to stimuli. So if the mannequin, if you can make the mannequin breathe, you can make it cry, you can insert fake drugs and it will respond to the intervention. Um, this technique is less resource exhaustive than having the standardized patient, meaning I don't have to hire an actor. Um, however, I do have to have somebody behind the scenes monitoring and running the technology. So I'm the person who makes the mannequin cry or makes them make noise or um, things like that. So, uh, but it does also track and provide the learners with some feedback. It gives automated feedback like reactions to stimuli, but it also collects objective metrics. So if I was doing CPR compressions, did I go deep enough? Was my timing off? Um, and then we can use that data during our, our debrief or after action review. Stream-based um, or virtual reality simulations for the external purposes, um, so not like laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery, uh, usually are focused on simulating an environment to train procedural or pro protocol knowledge. So it, it helps to train steps um, with little to no support. Um, they're not usually typically used or ideal for any kind of psychomotor skills, like the placing the tourniquet or the needle, because they don't allow the learner to physically control anything. So this is just kind of like a point and click just to learn um, protocols or safety things. So team training um, helps the learner to take all of the things that they've learned siloed in separate scenarios and practice them in a realistic environment. Uh, the trainings are built to represent the stressful, high-paced environment where the learned skills will actually be applied. So in a medical scenario, it's not going to be calm. You're not going to be by yourself. You're always going to be working with a team. Um, there's going to be multiple opinions and multiple hands, uh, jobs being completed at the same time. So it allows everybody to come in in their role to kind of play out the larger event. So here you see we have like an OR situation, we have an ER situation, and even in like the delivery room. They do things like this for EMT training as well and firefight training. So to foster teamwork and communication, they had to develop several teamwork standards um, because historically there's always been, there's this hierarchy in the ER, the OR, or any medical event really, where the surgeon kind of calls the shots. They're the ones doing the procedure, carrying all the liability, they're the most educated uh, to complete the task at hand. So a lot of times you'll see that the rest of the staff are just too afraid to communicate to the leader and it's caused um, some patient safety issues. So standards like the crisis resource management and team steps have been implemented to help remove that hierarchy and kind of open the walls of communication and safety for patients. So that if I'm a nurse, 
and I notice at the end of a procedure that my needle count is off, that I have the steps to communicate to my surgeon without feeling like afraid to communicate with him or her. And now we're going, gonna go over some surgical simulations, but before we can do that, we really need to kind of dive into the different types of surgery being completed today. And Roger kind of mentioned it in the beginning, he talked about laparoscopic surgery. Um, surgical modalities, there are still two large sets that are being completed today. You have laparotomy or open surgery, which is where a surgeon makes a large incision and, they're, and that's on the left hand side. And they're working with their hands and the tools directly inside of the patient's body. So they're, vi they're visualizing the, the anatomy um, directly. And then you have laparoscopic, which is, or keyhole surgery, some call it, where they use small incisions and you insert a camera and the instrumentation into the patient through those small incisions. So their hands are actually um, navigating the instruments on the outside of the patient. Um, and as of more recently, around the year 2000, the introduction of robotics, where the surgeon is manipulating those long surgical instrumentations outside of the patient, still like laparoscopic, but now they're sitting at a separate surgical console that translates those movements onto arms of a robot where the instruments are attached. So you can kind of see at the bottom here, you see the, the surgeon using their hand and the robotic arms where the instruments would be attached to the patient. For open surgical simulators, there's a really, a, this procedure, open procedure is the basis of the surgical training. So they need to grasp these skills before they can move on to those more technical procedural types like laparoscopic or robotic. So this is kind of a staple. And the current climate of medical practice, there are reduced surgical hours for exposure. So you see the picture where they're all looking over the cadaver. They Now they're limited to 80 hour work weeks. And I know that's a lot, but before we were just working them so that they could see it one-on-one -on -one and learn it. Um, so with that kind of restriction, surgeons aren't being trained, they're, they're not getting as much one-on-one um, -on -one training as they did. They're not getting to see these surgical, surgical uh, procedures happening daily as much as they were. So really what they've done is they've opened other modalities and methods. So we still use live animals, just like in the pictures Roger showed before. Um, we still heavily rely on cadavers, but now we also have things like bench models and virtual reality software um, to help kind of bridge that gap between uh, getting the practice hands-on and learning in a simulation experience. Laparoscopic simulation tends to almost always be computer-based because as Roger mentioned before, it just made sense now that they were already looking at a screen doing the procedure to just flip a computer between there. Um, so there are a large number and a, a wide variety of standalone stand laparoscopic simulators in the VR realm. Um, and they can, can contain dozens or hundreds of exercises, usually um, just focused on dexterity or navigating the camera, picking a needle up, throwing a needle, basic skills like that. Um, there are even more simple ones like the white box that you see on the left where you can use a tablet or a phone and then just use instruments in a white box and the surgeon can um, work on some kind of excised tissue or either even a silicone plastic model to practice dexterity or needle throwing and things, uh, basic surgical skills needed before they advance. So whether the surgeon is being trained for open or laparoscopic surgery, uh, dry lab simulations are built to help train specific skills at an extremely low cost. So these things, like you see the one in the middle is just a silicone pad um, developed for suturing. So whether you're learning how to throw a needle and suture in an open environment, whether you're doing it laparoscopic or robotically, it just allows you to run suture, tie knots, and practice that dexterity on something that costs $100 rather than the latter of um, the price of an inanimate model or a cadaver. Um, and then there's other things like the uh, one on the left-hand side that just teaches dexterity. So this was actually made for robotic training, but can be used for open or lap uh, 
and it's to navigate little rings around what they call a roller coaster, just to practice moving your surgical instrument in awkward angles. And now there are more advanced dry lab surgical skills trainers that are aimed to train those surgical skills I mentioned before, but all in one location. So here we have the FRS dome, the dome shaped one. Um, it trains over 16 psychomotor skills through seven exercises that are all located on one device. It's reusable and affordable, so, um, and it allows you to develop, this one was specifically for robotics, but you can use it for laparoscopic or open. So it allows you to develop uh, specific skills needed to complete uh, surgery. So again, those knot tying, needle throwing, cutting, dexterity kind of skills. Another surgical trainer that we often use um, in almost every training is really anything wet. It can be excised animate tissue like the uh, top right hand side one that's um, bowel from a porcine model. Um, or it could be something like turkey thigh on the left hand side that just allows the surgeon to practice those skills learned on the dry lab stuff but on a realist, more realistic feel. Um, on the silicone models, they don't react like human anatomy does. So this is the next best thing uh, before you get to the cadaver or the uh, anatomic lab. So excised tissue allows the surgeon to get the feel at that low, low cost. And also on all those other simulators we've talked about, there's something that you really can't use and that's applying energy. So in surgery today, you use energy to cauterize and cut a lot. And this is one of the first and cheapest ways in simulation to apply that, that skill. So in dry lab stuff, we can't apply energy to those. So we would have to use a wet, wet training lab to practice that skill set. So then when it comes to robotic surgery, the da Vinci robot, which is what we usually talk about because it's the most widely used robotic system, um, is an extremely augmented version of laparoscopic surgery. And it has a lot of benefits to the surgeon and to the patient, but it's expensive. It costs between $1.5 to $2 million. And access is often limited for surgeons who are already skilled and open and laparoscopic to make the shift to, shift to robotic because if the hospital is making an investment of $2 million, then the robot is typically in the operating room trying to recoup that investment. So it has generated a market for standalone simulators that can be used at a much lower cost point. So there are currently four of them on the market just for the da Vinci alone, um, standalone VR simulators, and they all run around the range of $100,000. And while other FDA-approved surgical robots begin to appear, they will also create these standalone simulators, um, not only because of the economic advantage of using the simula simulator, but because the FDA is insistent on having a progressive, objective, and measurable training program when it comes to any kind of robotic device. And these devices and simulators are helpful because not only do they allow the surgeon to practice the skills on something that's less expensive, they let this allow the surgeon to practice proctor free. And at the end of every exercise that a surgeon completes, it gives them an objective metric and scoreboard. So it tells them things, some critical things that they would need to know when they move into the actual OR, like how much blood was lost. Were there any excessive force in the instrument? Did you drop a needle anywhere? So it gives them um, thresholds so that they know when they leave that training where they kind of stand with their skill set. It's a short clip of a robotic surgical simulated exercise. This specifically is the robotics mentor. Um, this is one of the very few procedural exercises. This is a novice robotic surgeon that I trained utilizing the simulator to complete a simulated robotic hysterectomy from start to finish. And while you see when you first start, the initial imagery and anatomical set setting looks really good. It looks really realistic. Um, but as they continue on, there are several software issues and glitches. So when they go to retract the tissue, the tissue just doesn't react and retract the way real tissue will. And when they go to cut, it doesn't cut it the way that real tissue would. It just kind of like folds in. 
Um, and you'll see that in video games, they have such great programming and detail, but when it comes to medical VR, we're still behind in the aspect of how to get the tissue to match, simulated tissue to rat, match realistic tissue. Since we've discussed several types of medical simulation, um, I wanted to kind of talk about how to take that technology and equipment and transition it into a simulation program. So the next few slides, I discuss uh, some of the industry's best practices and guidelines for creating if you, a, an accredited medical simulation program. And currently, unfortunately, there are zero globally accepted standards that really comprehensively describe a simulation education center or educator. Um, and there's, while there's not a one size fits all, several societies have outlined benchmarks for creating what they think you should have to create a credible simulation program. The ones that we're going to talk about um, and the most commonly referred to are American College of Surgeons, Society for Simulation and Healthcare, American Society of Anesthesiologists, and American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And I'm sure it's likely for other professional organizations that are exploring going, moving forward and creating the, their own accreditation process, but these are the four most frequently referred to to date. So each of them have, each of the societies I mentioned have four categories that they mention for successful simulation programs. And it's really no surprise. You want to have a well-developed curriculum and assessment um, you need to have the appropriate instructors and supporting personnel. Uh, the equipment itself and the technology needs to be updated and running, and the infrastructure that will continuously support the simulation program. Um, but each of these societies mentioned here um, on this slide, they put their efforts and their focuses in one of two of these core areas. So it's helpful to know where they really um, focus on when you're creating your own to get accredited. And I'll give you an example on this slide. <clears throat> so here are some of the areas where societies focus more heavily on, on one area than others. The red areas indicate an emphasis of accreditation. So if you look at Society for Simulation and Healthcare, they really focus on the curriculum. And you, it's likely that you won't get credited from this if you don't have a strong curriculum. Um, and they also require that you have some kind of research uh, program attached to it. So that's the only out of the four that really focus on research. Um, whereas if you look at American College of Surgeons, they're very heavy on the infrastructure and the organization. You can't get accredited if you can't train over 20 people in one course. Um, so I just wanted to provide a couple examples of where they all kind of fall in the same four categories, four buckets of what they feel important, but each one of them have their specialty where they focus. Okay, and then um, this is just a slide that focuses on, um, it shows you how broad or specific each of the accreditation programs are. So Society for Simulation and Healthcare and American College of Surgeons, they support training for not only physicians, but medical students, nurses, and other uh, healthcare professionals and allied health. Um, whereas American College of Anesthesiologists and uh, ACOG only focus on physician learning. So before you want to create your own program and use these standards to, as a guideline for best practices, make sure that you're choosing one that kind of the tool learner is at the end. So if I want to do something that's um, physician and active health-based, then I probably don't want to base my simulation program off of ACOG or um, ASA. And then now I think I kick it back off over to Roger. I know we're running out of time. But... The military has a treatment chain that has five steps in it. And they have focused their investments in simulation of medical treatment in what they call role one and role two. And that's uh, when the soldier gets injured directly on the battlefield and how they're treated while they're laying relatively close to their point of injury, and then how they're treated once they're pulled out of harm's way, but still um, out in the field. Um, they haven't invested much in simulators that are specific to what they call role three, four, and five, because those steps are similar to what you would have 
in a US hospital system. And the training that happens there is almost identical in a military environment as it would be in a US hospital system. Uh, so they kind of rely on the civilian based training and civilian based simulators to fill those uh, areas. So if you look at military simulation systems, you'll find that they focus things like this, like this when the, uh, you're at the point of injury. Uh, this is when your, your buddy treats you or the combat medic treats you. And this particularly the Army had a really big program a few years ago, ago called the Medical Simulation Training Centers where they stood up a couple of dozen of these training centers all around the country and a few uh, internationally where they were trying to teach um, almost all soldiers that would go into combat the very basics of first aid and how to treat a buddy before a combat medic could get to them. And they literally trained tens of thousands of soldiers in these basic skills at the medical simulation training centers. The military has also invested in uh, simulators that are game-based uh, for tactical combat casualty care or TC3. And these are screenshots from two very different simulators. These are a little older, um, but they've, one, you can see that the uh, soldier has lost a leg. And I guess in the second one, the soldier's also lost his other leg. Oh no, the same leg. Um, the one on the right is unique because that game uh, was developed for the French military by French contractors and the capabilities that it uses are very similar to what you see in US-based acquisitions as well. And then if you become a little more modern, these are screenshots from a couple of games that are in use right now by the military uh, to treat uh, medical skills. And you can see by the quality of the visuals uh, that these are much newer game engines driving these. But most of the simulations that are military focused um, they fall into this area right at the point of injury. And then, of course, the military does live training very similar to the way hospitals do live training. Uh, they just happen to do it with um, the dressings and the, um, the accoutrements that you would find in the military as opposed to what you find in civilian healthcare. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up just a couple of things here. Um, where is this all going? And in general, what you see is improvements in the creation of physical training devices like cadavers and synthetic cadavers and synthetic materials and improvements in the virtual reality representation of those. And I think both of those are going to continue to happen. And there's limitations. There's a, a barrier in both of those areas, the digital creation and the physical creation of uh, human tissue. So, oh, oh, out of step here, that comes next. Let me unsay that. Um, what we also see is that as robotic surgery becomes more prevalent, the robot itself is becoming the host for the simulator. And so the simulator isn't always a separate device. It's integrated into the robot. And so having simulation, digital VR simulation, as a training tool is becoming much more common because the, the robot is a computer system and it can host all of the uh, software and visuals that are required for, uh, for training on the device itself. And that's unique. You couldn't do that with open surgery or laparoscopic surgery before this. Okay, this is the point I started to make earlier. Um, there's a limitation when you're creating digital tissue and when you're creating physical tissue. The properties of human tissue have not really been measured very well and put into a database and studied and then consulted as the source for creating uh, synthetic silicone tissue or creating synthetic digital tissue. That knowledge really hasn't existed until very recently. And uh, Rob Sweet, when he was at the University of Minnesota, really kickstarted this idea that the reason our silicone tissue is not that realistic and the reason that our virtual worlds don't have really rich, full procedures in them is because we don't really know how to model human tissue, either physically or um, in, in digital form. And that's why we continue to use a lot of cadavers and a lot of animals 
because we don't have to model it then. Um, but he was trying, he, he had programs where literally when somebody would die in the hospital at the University of Minnesota, when they went to uh, the morgue, one of his people would rush down there and with permission, with consent prior to, um, would take tissue samples from their organs and rush it off to a lab where they could physically, mechanically measure its elasticity and its tensile strength and how translucent it is and how dense it is so they could get that information into the database to create a digital version um, of those t that tissue in the future. And that work hasn't started to show up yet very much in virtual or in physical models, but I think it will. So this is the summary. Uh, this is the categories that we walked through and the kinds of general topics that we talked about in this presentation. And we're happy to take questions uh, to the degree that all of you are patient enough to remain out there and that the uh, IT system uh, is still up and working. We're uh, running a little late today, Roger, so we're not going to take uh, questions live. But if anybody does have questions, and once to submit them, you could, you could send them to info at uh, hdiac.org, and uh, we can follow up with uh, Roger and Danielle and try and get the, your questions answered. We'll, we'll do that uh, that way for uh, time consideration. Uh, but mm -hmm. I want to thank uh, you, Roger and Danielle, for the uh, thorough overview. It was very, very interesting, very uh, uh, good material. And I want to thank the uh, audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And we look forward to uh, having you, uh, seeing you at, at our future uh, webinars. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>